Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the Pastor's Study. Uh, it is so wonderful for you to join us to today's program uh, through the internet, through YouTube, through Facebook, ever how you happen to be getting it, whether it's on DVD. We are so proud for you to be able to be a part of this uh, Bible study, this time of fellowship, this time of worship. Uh, we're so thankful that you're here. We're thankful that you've taken the time out of your, I know your busy schedule, uh, to be able to be a part of it. Uh, I have some great news. Uh, I believe, or I hope, uh, unless something changes drastically, uh, in the next few days, uh, we have an opening date, uh, or reopening, or however you want to put it, uh, a time to be able to meet together in person. Uh, I'd like to tell you, or try to help you to understand just how much has gone into the planning uh, of us being able to come back together. As you know, uh, as I, I uh, last week uh, and Sunday, uh, we have done our best to comply with the CDC guidelines. Uh, the governor's, uh, Governor Kemp's website, uh, when people meet together, and there are, are quite a few little hurdles that we have to jump over in order to uh, stay in compliance. And I've encouraged you to go to the website, uh, look at uh, those 11 items there. You can download the document. You can look at the document online. Uh, when and if you're able to come Wednesday the 3rd, June the 3rd, uh, we will have a copy for you then. We want uh, this information to get out to as many people as possible. Uh, we'll do our very best to put signs on everything so that nobody has to wonder about what they should be doing and how they should be uh, uh, conducting themselves. You know, of course, naturally, it will be social distancing. Uh, we will have uh, masks. Uh, for you to use. We'll have some throwaway masks and we'll have some permanent ones. Uh, so we encourage you to come. Uh, we also encourage you to use them. Also, uh, we'll be doing, you know, several measures uh, to, we will meet in the fellowship hall on Wednesday night. Uh, again, those are all hard surfaces in there. It makes it possible for us to wipe it down uh, and to sanitize it. Uh, this particular week, unfortunately, uh, we will probably not have a uh, discipleship class by Brother Roger. Uh, Brother Roger's been doing the discipleship uh, while we've been kind of sheltering in place uh, because the normal teachers and stuff are, are not able to get out, you know what I'm saying, under these conditions. So uh, he's been doing that for us. We're very thankful for that. Uh, but Brother Roger had surgery last week, and he called me uh, Sunday night and told me that, uh, or Monday night rather, I'm sorry, uh, and told me that he would not be able to uh, come in and record the, uh, uh, the discipleship class. Uh, he was in a great deal of pain, and he was going back to the doctor. Uh, I have not gotten a report back yet on how that turned out. Uh, but he was trying to, to get some relief from that pain, and, and we hope and pray that uh, shortly he'll be able to be back with us and he'll be able to uh, uh, participate uh, in the programs uh, as it will be a little while, unfortunately, before we probably have a night service. So uh, so I encourage you to come out June the 3rd, 7 o'clock in the Fellowship Hall. Then that next Sunday on June the 7th, we will meet in the sanctuary at 11 a.m. That's our normal worship time. Uh, again, we will do social distancing there. Uh, again, we will have masks. We will have uh, all kind of hand sanitizer, all the things that, that we're required to provide to make you as safe as possible. Uh, that is our first and number one goal is for everyone to feel safe. We realize that there are some folks that are, are not going to be able to come because of underlying health conditions. Uh, maybe because of their age, they've chosen not uh, to come back at this time. Again, we encourage you, if that's what the way the Lord's leading you and that's what you feel is best for you and your family, please observe that. Uh, you know, the Holy Spirit talks to you just like he talks to me. Uh, and you do what God would have you to do. If you choose not to come back or not able to come back for whatever reason, if you call the church, we again are going to continue to uh, put these services on DVD. 
uh, so that you'll be, have an opportunity. You can still stay from your home, or you can still, again, they'll be on the internet, okay? Uh, so we're going to make a way for everybody to continue to go to church, uh, at least until we can get the alls clear uh, and where everybody feels comfortable and safe uh, with all, us all meeting back together. Again, I, I'd like to thank you. Again, please pray for Brother Roger uh, and his family. Uh, we, there are several prayer requests. I do not have all of them in front of me. However, if you would like the church prayer list, you can certainly receive that through email to your email box inbox by simply calling the church and giving Miss Carol your email address. Once a week on Wednesday, she sends out an updated list of all the prayer requests that have been given to her. She checks with me to see if there are any new ones from me, uh, and she makes sure that they get in there. So uh, please, 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 uh, if, you, if you're not getting it, please call the church office. Please talk with Miss Carol. She'd be happy to get that on there for you uh, and make it possible. So. So tonight, I, I have another sermon the Lord's kind of laid on my heart that relates to kind of where we're at today, and um, it's found in the book of 2 Kings. I hope if you, you're getting your Bibles or have your Bibles with you at this time, uh, and it's found in the book of 2 Kings chapter 7, 2 Kings chapter 7. Uh, and we're going to be using verses 3 through 9, chapter 7, verses 3 through 9. And as you're finding your way there, uh, I want to read you something that, uh, that I take great comfort in uh, when I think about uh, this whole idea and the guidelines and the, the, the not being able to have church in person and, and do corporate worship and and, of course, now I've heard that they're encouraging us not to sing hymns. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Certainly singing would, would increase the risk. You know what I'm saying? Uh, we certainly will sing something. We will encourage you to have your mask on if you feel more comfortable with that, uh, whatever way. But we probably will sing the hymns. It may not be quite as loud, uh, but we certainly will sing those. So, so come out and be a part of those services as you're able to. But anyway, while you're finding your way to, to 2 Kings uh, chapter 7, 2 Kings chapter 7, I want to read you something uh, from the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, I, I use this particular scripture uh, often when it comes to funerals uh, because it is so apropos at that particular time. And the writer of Ecclesiastes, King Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived, the Bible says, uh, because he had sought his wisdom from God, at the end of his life wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. And, and while it is somewhat of a melancholy book, um, he begins to understand that, that really that, that you know, life is, is kind of cyclical. Uh, uh, the, I think that the more we listen to the experts, such as they are, we're finding that, that this thing will be like influenza, like, like flu. It will be cyclical. And, and you know, life is kind of like that, isn't it? It's um, one week, everything is great, and maybe the next week not so much. Uh, but, you know, the good thing about it is, is that, that, you know, the bad times don't last forever, uh, and neither do the good times last forever. So, so I... In that vein, let me read you. This is in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. It says, To everything there is a season and a time, every, and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to cast away story, cast away stones, and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to get, a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to cast away, a time to rend, and a time to sow, a time to, to keep silent, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time of war, and a time of peace. 
So you see, what Solomon, I think, is trying to teach us there is, is that, that, that life is kind of cyclical. The situations that we find ourselves in are, are kind of cyclical. Sometimes they're, they're very bad. I, I don't know how else to characterize uh, this pandemic, uh, especially for the church as a whole. Uh, you know, this was not our best day. I, I mean, you know, things have been kind of tough on the church, uh, you know what I'm saying? Because there is something special about uh, corporate worship. And so, so as we look at these times, I want to look at an example uh, of, of a time that was very, very bad uh, and, and the deliverance that God provides. And, and even in this, folks, you know, I see this reopening as a, as a type of deliverance. I see this as a, a type of, of God saying, okay, uh, things are not as bad as maybe we thought they would be, uh, and it's time for us to go back and get back to um, the work at hand, the mission of the kingdom. So, if you've got your Bibles again, we want to go to 2 Kings chapter 7. Now today, as we look at this story, it, it kind of, or this account in the Bible, it kind of centers around four Israelite men. And, and they're not just any four Israelite men, they're four lepers. Now, uh, that's significant because uh, a life for a leopard in ancient Israel or biblical times uh, was not an easy life. Matter of fact, actually, uh, they were cast out of the city uh, to prevent leprosy from spreading uh, amongst the population. Uh, isn't it interesting that, that God already understood how to quell pandemics by, uh, with the ancient Israelites by what they ate, uh, by the way they, he required ritual washings, by the way you know somebody that had something that was infectious was put outside the camp. Uh, uh, I guess we, today we call it social distancing maybe. Uh, but these four men uh, are in a bad way. Uh, and so you have to know a little bit of the background. Uh, matter of fact, they're in a bad time. Uh, and their capital city, which is Samaria, is going through a famine. Okay, and matter of fact, actually in chapter six is where the account is where the woman says, "Hey, uh, you know, uh, they they were began to eat their children uh, because the city was being besieged by the Samaritans, uh, and they and they had I'm sorry by the Syrians." Uh, and they were at a point of starvation. They, uh, that's usually how they did that, you know what I'm saying? In those walled cities, they surrounded them, and they just held out until all the food and water ran out. Uh, and so uh, they are at a point of, in chapter 6, verses 24 and on, uh, tell, gives an account of two women that are arguing over uh, to, which child to eat. Uh, so if, if you understand what I'm saying, times are pretty desperate, uh, maybe even far more desperate than what we're looking at right now, but, but, but desperate all the same. And so what I want to try and pull from this story today, or this account, uh, is how and what we should do and respond. You know, I, I met this past, or early in the week with our uh, 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 Kilpatrick Association pastors. And, and without fail, well, probably without exception, every one of them is frustrated um, because, again, everything keeps changing, uh, keep moving the goalposts, if you will. Uh, and that makes it very hard uh, for churches to plan what they will do, uh, especially with safety in mind uh, and sanitation in mind. So, so let's take a look at this story. Uh, it is here in uh, 2 Kings chapter 7. Uh, let's begin in verses 3 and 4. 3 and 4. It says, And there were four leprous men at the entering in of the gate. And they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city, and we will die there. If we sit still here, we die also. Now therefore come and let us fall into the host of Syrians of the, of the Assyrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. Now, there were some choices in front of them. Uh, they could go into the city 
and, and as we described, in the city was famine. And said, if we go in the city, uh, we're going to die there. We're going to die from starvation. Might, they might even take their lives because they were leprous. Uh, I don't know. But, but they said, if we go into the city, we're going to die. And then it goes on to say, he said, not only if we go into the city, uh, we will die. But it says, if we sit here, we're going to die. And so he asks a question in verse 3. He says, why sit we here until we die? And, and, and I relate that to kind of where we're at today because there is a famine in America today. Uh, if you will, a, a, a spiritual famine. A famine in the hearts of men uh, about God. Matter of fact, actually, the Bible tells us in Amos chapter 8 and verse 11, it says, Behold, the day cometh, saith the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. In other words, you know, he was saying that, you know, there's coming a day when people just not going to listen to good, they're not going to listen to the truth. And boy, I'll tell you, when you go to 2 Thessalonians and begin to start reading there in chapter 2 about God sending a strong delusion at the end time. Man, I'll tell you, you can, you can turn on just about any media source, and their credibility has just been picked apart, uh, not by anybody else, but by their own selves. Uh, the inaccuracies, the, the spin that's put on the news, the, 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 I don't know that you really even believe the fact, what they claim to be facts anymore, uh, because there's such an agenda behind it. So, so, you know, Amos said, God said there's coming a day when there's going to be a famine in the land. Now, we re all realize that right now meat, if you've had to buy any meat, you know it's, it's getting more and more expensive. But, but that's not the famine that he's talking about. He's talking about a famine for the words of God. In other words, there's coming a time, and it is right now, where people don't want to hear the truth. They don't want to hear what the Bible has to say about a particular issue. They don't want to know what God thinks or what God is saying or how we should respond. No, no, they, they, there's a famine today, folks. And, and that famine produces desperation. You see, they were in desperate times. Uh, they had some choices to make, and I'll be quite honest with you, none of them were great. Now, if you stop and think about it for a minute, uh, they could go into the city and die. They could stay where they were at, and they could die. Or they could go out to their enemies. Now, you need to understand something about this desperation as it relates to their enemies. Because you're living in a day and time, or they were, when there was no Geneva Convention where there wasn't a, a, a code of the way prisoners should be treated. Uh, matter of fact, you were, you were living in a day and time where if you went into your captors and they decided to skin you alive and hang you uh, on a pike and let you die two days later, there was no one to stop them. There was no one to think that that was uh, uh, inappropriate or immoral. They just simply did it. So, so these four men are desperate because you see in Leviticus chapter 13 and verses 40, 46 it says as long as he has the infection talking about leprous people he remains unclean he must live alone he must live outside the camp you see whether we realize it or not <laughs> they, 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 they didn't have any good situations they didn't have any good choices, I guess what I would call good choices. But you know, they couldn't return to Syria. They knew that. And, and you know, people say, well, we're, we're working with the new normal. Well, you know, we can't return to Samaria either. Listen to this. This is in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 38. It says, now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul, this is God talking, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. So they couldn't go back. And, and you know, I, I've talked to some people about coming back to church, and, and I've talked to some folks that, that really, in their heart of hearts, believe that it will be uh, like it was before March the 8th, which was the first service we didn't have. 
And, and, you know, you have to ask yourself, you know, is it going to be the same? Well, certainly it's not going to be the same. Uh, you know, I, I, if, if you're not a member here, if we're like most churches our size, we're very friendly. We're, we're very fellowship oriented. We love to shake hands. We love to hug necks. We love to talk to our friends and our neighbors and our loved ones uh, face to face. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Closer than six feet. And, and so, you know, we think that everything is going to be the same if we'll just return back to the way it was. No, it's not. It's going to be different. Uh, I can assure you. As a matter of fact, actually, in my opinion, it's going to be painfully different. Because I don't know about you, it's, it's hard for me to imagine uh, being around you, uh, the, the people that I love the most in this world, and not be able to hug your neck, not be able to shake your hand. Uh, you know, it's really been almost three months uh, since I've sh shaken anyone's hand. Because today, right now, where we find ourselves, the situation we find ourselves in, we can't do that. That's, that's not uh, conducive to good health. So they were in desperate times. I, I think for some of us, well, we're, we're in desperate times. And so when you feel like you're besieged about with trouble, when you feel like, you know, uh, maybe there's something in your life that's going on right now, and you're saying, Lord, I, I don't know what we should do. Perhaps there's a, a crisis. I, I don't know. Maybe your job is in jeopardy. Maybe you're not able to return to your job. Uh, there's a lot of businesses uh, that are not going to reopen after this. A lot of smaller businesses. Uh, and what a tr tragedy and shame that will be. So, so maybe you're right now, you're like those four men. You don't really know what decision to make. Really, in your eyes, there's, there's not a good decision. Now, he said, if we sit here, or why sit here till we die? He says, if I sit here, I'm going to die too. He said their, their plight, in a sense, was kind of like, that of the prodigal son. They came to their senses only after they had fallen to the bottom part, to the, the sinking to the lowest part or the lowest ebb. To do nothing meant starvation and death. And you know, that spiritual famine that we were talking about, you know, to do nothing with the claims of Christ is, is, is to say, I, I choose death. You know, Christ offered us life, abundant life, life eternal. And to do nothing with his promises, to say thank you but no thank you. What, what a tragedy that is to see, you know what, that their disease, which in the Bible is a, leprosy is a type of sin, was eating their lives away. They were dying. And they were going to die whether they went out, whether they stayed in, whether they went to their enemy, either way, they were kind of the proverbial rock and hard place. That's exactly where these four men were. But they said, hey, look, you know, to do nothing is death. And folks, I believe with us, I believe in our nation today, to do nothing is death. To do nothing is death, period. So there has to come a time when we have to make a decision. Now, the next thing that I want us to look at is, is this provision of deliverance. Look at me in verses 5 through 7. Verses 5 through 7. And they arose up in the twilight, and they rose up, this is the four men now, rose up in the twilight to go into the camp of the Syrians, and when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of the Syrians, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against, hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come 
on us. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their horses and their donkeys, even the camp as it was, and they fled for their life. You know, I don't know that... <laughs> I've never been in the situation that these four men have been in, but I'll tell you this much. They had to make a great decision. But you know what? Their idea was, whether God took care of them or not, they had to make a decision. And you know what? Their problem up and ran away when God showed up. In other words, when they said, hey, look, you know what? We're going to go into the Syrians because we're going to die anyway. Let them kill us if they're going to kill us. When they got to the camp, guess what they found out? This huge Syrian army, which had besieged the city for so long, was empty. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation. I was in a church like that one time where it just appeared like everything was almost left the way it was. It was like... it. it it, it, for lack of a better word, it almost looked like the rapture had taken place. I mean, literally, in the Sunday school rooms where Sunday school literature opened up to a certain page with particular passages underlined. Pews, in the pews, Bibles lay in the pews open to certain scriptures. Hymnals, the same way. And so, this is what they round up with these four men when they went into the Syrian camp. Expecting to be met with hostilities was empty. Now, as we read the account, what we find out is, is that you know what? That God had been there ahead of them. And as a matter of fact, actually it tells us that the Lord of hosts had made them to hear a great noise. In other words, they had heard the sound of what they thought was chariots. This, this kind of harkens back to uh, uh, the uh, Egyptian and Israelite war. Uh, I think it was the Six Day War, Seven Day War. And, and you, I, I remember the testimony of the Egyptian tank commanders. And, and man, they were bearing down on Israel. They were ready to go to war. They were ready to take back land from them. And, and when the Israelites went out to them, guess what they found out? All the tanks were abandoned. And when they finally heard the testimony of the Egyptians, they heard a great noise. They heard a noise like battalions of tanks coming toward them. And they fled for their lives. And that's exactly what happened here. They thought that, you know what, the Israelite king had went out and hired some Egyptians and the Hittites to fight for them as mercenaries. And here they come. They're coming in the middle of the night, and they're going to slay every one of us. I like the way uh, the Bible puts it. They fled for their own lives. Now think about that for just a minute. They fled for their own life. In other words, when God showed up, when God made provision, guess what happened? God showed up and he showed out. And folks, I'll tell you what today. If we'll trust God with this whole situation, if we'll trust him to say, Lord, you know what? You're absolutely in control. Why this thing may seem out of hand for all of us, why we may not even understand, why we look around and we watch the, the television and we find out that the expert aren't as expert as they thought they were, and we say, Lord, what are we going to do? Well, that's when the Bible says to lean not to your own understanding. That's when the Bible says that, you know what, that he's got a plan for your life. And you know what, it, he knows all of your yesterdays, all your todays, and all your tomorrows before they ever occurred. He knew you. He loved you. The psalmist, I love the way the psalmist put it. He said, before I was ever born, he knew my name. And he knows your name. He knows what you're going through. He knows the loneliness that you may be experiencing right now. He knows the desperation that you might be experiencing right now. He knows for me the frustration that I experience when I I listen to the, the media and try to figure out what course of action is best for our church. He knows all that. And he has provided deliverance. You know, sometimes he has to tell me, Clayton, you know what? Quit struggling. Leave it to me. 
won't you just won't you just depend on me now that doesn't mean a period of inaction where we do nothing that's not what I'm saying but what I'm trying to say is that you know what God's got this we may not understand how it may be difficult it may be long before you know what I'm saying that that deliverance is seen but God is going to deliver us you say now preacher now how do you know that because he promised me in Hebrews that he'd never leave me nor forsake me why would he leave his bride the church helpless he wouldn't do that he just absolutely would not do that so there was that time of provision of deliverance and then there was a, a, a period of delight Listen to what they find out here in verse 8 as they enter into the camp. And when these leopards came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went in one tent and did eat and drink and carried thence silver and gold and raiment and went and hid it and came again and entered into another tent and carried thence also and went and hid it. There was this period of the light. They began to start plundering the Syrians. Man, when they went into the tent, not only did they find food, I bet they found some chickens on the grill or, or whatever. I don't know. Whatever they had to eat, they had it there. They had flour. They had meal. They had barley. They had all the things that they didn't have in Samaria. So there was a period of delight. A period of delight after they experienced God's deliverance now listen in verse 8 as he says and when these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp they went into one tent and did eat and drink and carried then silver and gold and raiment and went and hid it and came again and entered into another tent and carried thence also and went and hid it so now they had come from I guess uh, famine to feast. In other words, they had spoiled the Assyrians and did nothing but just enjoy God's deliverance. And God delighted them by showing them they enjoyed God's blessings because they had made a decision. They had made a decision uh, to go forward. And when they did, man, there was all kinds of things, the gold, the silver, uh, the food, the water. There was everything that they needed uh, to be able to be blessed and to enjoy the blessings of God. There were riches to be found when they obeyed the Lord, when they trusted him. And, and folks, let me tell you something. There are riches to be found in our nation today. There are riches to be found even in this drastic crisis that we're in right now if we would just but turn to the Lord and turn to him for deliverance. But then finally, they realized that not only did they enjoy his deliverance, not only was there a, a period of delight, but there was a time for practice of duty. A time for practice of duty. Join me in verse 9. It says, And then they said one to another, We do well. This day is a day of good tidings, and we hold our and, and we hold our peace. If we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us now, will come upon us. Now therefore come that we may go and tell the king's household. So they came and they called to the porter of the city and they told them saying, We came to the camp of the Syrians and behold, there was no man there, neither was there voice of man, but horses tied and donkeys tied and and the tents as they were. And he called the porters and they told it to the king's house within. In other words, you know what? They couldn't hold the good news to themselves. In other words, what they realized was that, you know what? They had been blessed. These helpless lepers, instead of staying there and saying, hey, let's just steal as much as we can get and, and tote it off, as, enjoy God's deliverance. No, we need to go tell someone else. You see, they had found great wealth, but they'd found more than that. They'd found great peace in God's deliverance. Great hope 
where they were one time hopeless. And, and folks, that's what God's deliverance does. And I hope that even in this difficult time, even in this time of crisis, even in this time of pandemic, that you'll allow God to give you hope because his deliverance brings exactly that. It brings security. It brings love. But you know what I want you to know in verse 9? It says we, we need to share this. We need to tell someone else. And you know, when God, when we enjoy God's deliverance, hope, security, peace, we need to share that. When we enjoy uh, what God has blessed us with and enjoy his deliverance, when, when we say, hey, you know what, what a testimony. We came from a place of hopelessness. We came from a place of death. As a matter of fact, every decision now just seemed like it ended in our death. But we moved forward. We trusted God. Wouldn't that be a great testimony to our nation today? You know what? We, there were no good decisions. But you know, we made the one that honored God, the one that trusted God for the outcome. And in the end, guess what? He delivered. I think our nation so desperately needs to understand that today. I think we, as God's people, need to understand that today. You know, how can we find the hope we enjoy in Christ and not be willing to share with others? You know, how can we enjoy the blessings of God, the security of God, and not be willing to share it with others? You've joined me many times here in this study, and I've told you, God can use this he can use this as a blessing if we will just but allow him to. He can use this as an open door, an open door to reach a neighbor, a loved one, a friend, someone that just starts up a conversation about, hey, what are you doing for the virus? And you know what you'll hear? You'll hear a lot of fear. You'll hear a lot of, well, I don't know. I don't know what we're going to do. I don't know how we should respond. What an opportunity. What an opportunity to be able to share with those who have no hope, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the hope that God's deliverance brings. What a, what a being able to come from a point of desperation to a point of deliverance and delight. We all have that capabilities. Folks, I hope today that you will avail yourself of that. I hope this account has brought you some hope and some peace. I know as I read it, and as I see God's deliverance in his hand, I'm blessed beyond measure. I'm blessed to know that my hope isn't in our government, isn't in our economy, it isn't even in our military, but our hope is in Jesus Christ. And I have the promise, and you do too if you're his child, that he'll never leave you nor forsake you. Old times may look tough. These four men understood that. Well, you know, you may have got some bad news from the doctor. These men understood that. Well, you know, it kind of took us by surprise. We weren't expecting that. Uh, these men understood that. But we need to ask ourselves today, will we just sit here till we die? Or will we trust our God? Will we move forward? I'm not talking about being foolish, but will we believe him? Will we trust him? Will we lay all of this at the foot of the cross knowing that he has the ultimate outcome? Today I would encourage you. There's a time and a season, remember Ecclesiastes, for everything under the sun. There's a time for this. I hope it's coming to an end. I hope it's not coming back, but it might. But if it does, God can still work that ultimately to our good. But we have to trust him. Dearly beloved, remain safe. Thank you so much for joining me through this uh, time of Bible study and prayer. Know that we love you. Know that we long for you. Know that we are praying for you. If I can help you, please call me. And don't forget now, don't forget, June the 3rd, 7 o'clock, prayer meeting in the in the fellowship hall and then on the 7th 
we will have church service at 11 a.m. So we encourage you. Begin now. Begin praying about whether God would have you to come be with us. Go to the website. Look at all of the uh, the the uh, conditions. Look at all of the, the efforts that are being made to keep you as safe as possible. Know that we adhere to them uh, at the recommendation of the CDC. So join me as we close this service in a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, as we bow in your presence, Lord, we love you tonight. We thank you so much for your blessings. And Father, we ask, Lord, that you would truly bless. Father, our, our nation is almost like these four lepers. Lord, they're, they're at a crossroads. They're at a point where it seems like no matter which way we turn, depending on what experts you listen to, uh, the end is doomed. But Father, anytime we've turned to you, anytime we've turned to Jesus, we've never been disappointed. Father, every time we've turned to you, we've enjoyed deliverance. And Father, I would pray now for the deliverance of our nation. Not by a doctor, not by an expert, not by a politician, but Lord, by turning to you. Father, we pray now that you'd encourage our folks. Lord, we pray that you'd be with Brother Roger, that you'd heal him, help him to get better. Lord, all of our shut-ins that have been unable to get out and about, Father, bless them. Lord, bless our church. Now, Father, watch over us and keep us safe. And Lord, as we prepare to come back to have in-person services, bless that time too, that we might enjoy the fellowship, the hope, and the peace that being together brings. Now, Lord, we ask you to forgive us where we failed you. Watch over us. Keep us safe. And we'll praise you. We'll worship you and honor you because we've asked all of this in the precious and the holy name of Jesus. And my family said with me, Amen. God bless you, dearly beloved. Know that we love you. And again, please be safe.